So um, the way I envisage this working is we'll, um, we'll talk about the, the individual um, topic areas for a little while. Um, but what I really want to get into is, is, is sort of a, a thread that pulls all these things together, which is kind of the future of the future of video and the video experience, you know, touching on uh, some of the points that Chris just made. So, and then, you know, we'll, um, we'll do some Q&A at the end and it'll all be over uh, in, time for, in time for the next session. So um, maybe starting with, with Outstream, um, where are we? Where, where, where are we with, with Outstream now? What's the, what's, where, what's the state of the, of the market, Justin? Well, as sort of mentioned, um, the IAB stats put Outstream in the UK at currently 40% of the uh, video market. Um, so if we're approaching a sort of 850 to 900 million market in the UK in 2016, um, it's a significant size. Um, I think the big changes of what we're seeing in Outstream, though, is um, the idea that brands um, and agencies are now looking at how to utilize, I guess, bespoke video uh, within these Outstream units versus just translating sort of the TVCs uh, within uh, the units that they've been done before. So it's starting to see a maturity uh, within the understanding of the device and within the form as well. Yeah, what, uh, where, do you, where do you see Outstream at the moment? Well, the way I look at Outstream, I think it's, it's, it's a medium, right? So we had, a few years ago, we had a problem of scale in video. A lot of solutions came into place. Some of them were not high quality, provided scale. We had a lot of challenges with fraud. And the industry is maturing and get, getting to a state that today Outstream is said in the previous panel as well. It's, it's here to stay. It's a premium uh, um, way of showing video at scale on many pages. You don't have to have a video pages. You don't have to produce content. People can embed videos in, in article pages and galleries and a lot of different uh, places on their site. And the question now is, what's the next step? So there's going to be natural evolution of more adoption by publishers of Outstream, improving, doing it better, advertisers understanding that that's a great format and spending more money. But beyond that, there is also the question of what else can we provide? Because it is, I mean, it's, 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 it's a format, it's a platform. So what does that fit to? What kind of advertising? If it's 40%, advertisers, do they need to build dedicated uh, um, creatives for that format? It's not a pre-roll. There are actually opportunities of showing longer ads, uh, maybe opportunities to do other different things. So I think that's the next step for Outstream. I think we're already at the point that it's, it's here. It's providing the ability to show video, but that's, that's really just step one. So that's how I see it. So, um, um, so um, just to give us a kind of bit of a frame of reference, who, who's doing it well? Where do, you, where do you look and say, okay, this is, this, is, this is kind of best practice? So I think that there are a lot of companies going into this, spe uh, this uh, space now because there's, there's a real need for it. And I think that, and I think Tita's done a really good job in starting the market and, and, and getting publishers to understand that. I think they've done a lot of the education and, and allowing now companies to do uh, other things and see where, where do companies add value. The way I look at it from a publisher perspective, um, I think the publishers that are doing it well are the ones that are not necessarily looking at it as an always on format. So I think if we look at display and where, where did we mess up display, we did mess up display. As we started, it was great. People were paying really high CPMs for these banners, and it was a fixed placement that I decided that I'm going to put, and then I have to fill it. Traffic is growing. I still have to fill it. So I start selling it lower and lower in price. My revenue goes down. Next step is let's throw more banners on the side because we need more revenue. And it kind of gotten to this point that this is not an effective format. It's a race to the bottom. It's, it's not effective for advertisers. It's annoying users. Video and specifically Outstream, we're in a great opportunity. It's a video format. Advertisers <coughs> are willing to pay a premium for it. We need to treat it with that respect. So I think it's an opportunity for publishers to actually have less ads and make the same or even more money. And I'm, I'm seeing two types of publishers. Some of them, they're trying to fill 100% all their page views with videos. That's the wrong way of doing it, in my opinion. And we see publishers that are like, OK, if we're able to get uh, a $10 CPM and fill 70%, let's increase our prices. Let's keep this inventory a coveted inventory that is valuable and generating uh, um, better value, but keep its price high. So th th these are the two uh, most common uh, conversations we have with publishers. I was going to sort of build on that um, because we're all saying a very similar thing here. Yeah, the, 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 posit the positives around Outstream um, are that it inherently respects the end user. 
if we think about video and the way it's grown, um, it's very much grown from an analog, um, uh, analog history. Uh, what, I mean, what I mean by that is, you know, TV has been delivered in a linear way, um, and advertising and the value exchange has been set up in a very linear way as well. In the new sort of modern economy, uh, the end user doesn't understand the sort of payoff um, when they're in a mobile environment or a desktop environment of being forced to watch an, adver an advertisement uh, within sort of video before a bit of content, especially if that content is only a minute, two minutes long. So that sort of interruptive advertising is a big, big challenge. Um, the same for those sort of interstitials or pop-ups. Um, that's a big, big challenge as well because it's interrupting that user experience. And any research that we've all done and we've all seen really shows that's the biggest motivator for ad blocking. So you need to have a format that is very much about user control. Um, and that's what Outstream does. <coughs> it gives you that user control, whether it's Outstream within a social feed, whether it's on a publisher, it gives you the control. If I don't want to see it, I can scroll past it. If I want to engage with it, I have to do something with that ad. So it's very much viewable by design or engaged by design as well. So coming back to the point of who's doing it well, you know, clients who understand that sort of notion of gaining capture within that first 5, 10, 15 seconds um, are focusing on very much mobile-driven opportunities, you know, be that a landscape type of video that's in the stream, or more importantly, and where the big growth areas are coming, around the sort of square, around the sort of vertical formats, they're the ones that are really seeing the sort of benefits of what Outstream can offer now in terms of that user engagement, that sort of purchase intent, and that sort of recall that comes from this. All of this is great, but you know, if I mean, we've seen historically that the you know that, that something something makes money, the 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 tendency is right. Let do more of it, you know, um, you know. Uh, I you know I you know, I think you know, I to totally appreciate your point, but do you think do you think we're robust enough to to resist the temptation to just go yeah we, oh, every page this is working do more of it make it happen. I think it's a it's a. It's a big problem because also we're not, uh, there's a, like I'll keep referencing previous panels, but to, sh to show I participated, of course, uh, to show I listened. But they talked about, like Amir was saying uh, from Trinity, if, if all 10 biggest publishers would not uh, partner with someone like Facebook, then we can do it. But the moment five do it, it creates a problem. I think we're, we're in a similar state here. There are a lot of companies trying to get uh, into the outstream uh, space and they offer, like a lot of them have to be able to compensate and, and offer higher CPMs. There are a lot of publishers that are, they need the revenue, and, and that is a big opportunity for them. So I think it, it is not, uh, there's no clear answer there. And I'm not saying that there is, this is the only way of doing it. I just, I think that as an industry, we need to start providing publishers with those metrics. So most of the platforms in the industry are offering pretty basic reporting, look at your CPM, your revenue for the last seven days. I think what would be, would be really good if all of us will start also sh showing load time and time spent on site and number of pages per visit. And I think if we start showing that to publishers, then you know, they understand that the difference here is not making more money uh, versus not. It's making more money tomorrow versus making more money in the next six months. So I think we just have to start giving them that data. And once we do, I, hopefully the, the, the decision is much easier. From, a, from an outstream point of view, what we can't do in this sort of um, growth phase of the outstream business is start adding very negative user experiences. So start having ads that play with sound straight on, that you know, force the user to engage with it. We have to make sure at all times we're respecting that end user, that they have the control. And then we can grow it in a very transparent, honest way that um, publishers um, generate more revenue, more yield, um, brands get more sort of view time, and the consumers get an ad that they actually want to see. But we are, you know, we're, we're in a place where, where, where you know, the, we know that the slightest bad experience is going to drive, is going to drive people away, and, and the, you know, there is not going to be many second chances. I think we need to start measuring it. I think that we need to start looking at the data. We've had, like, the most common, I'm sure for you guys, the same thing, the most common conversation, we talk to one group uh, uh, with a publisher, and then there is that editorial team that is somewhere in the building, nobody knows really where, and then, okay, editorial needs to approve it. And I think some of the decisions from an editorial team will always be a decision. This is an ideology thing, and this is what we want to do, and that's great. You know, we, what we've done is we offered a studio for the publisher to customize and have the experience behave the, like, in, into how they want to do it. But I think the other thing we need to provide the business people when they talk to the editorial team is data. So when you say, 
if the slightest experience causes users uh, to do this or that. Like, we need to do the research. We need to see if there is a big difference of opening a video in the middle of the article versus the, the bottom of the article. What, what, does, what is the difference in value for the advertiser, for the publisher from a revenue perspective, and for the user? We need to start looking at data. Um, and th th that's what I hope we'll, we'll be able to do next year in, as an industry. And you need, to, you, know, you need to be testing not just the, the technical contextual experience, but also the creative. Because True. I think what we're seeing, you know, de definitely, you know, what, you know, what we're seeing at Adjust Your Set is actually when you're repurposing kind of interruptive TV commercials and trying to put them in a mobile experience in an outstream or even in a pre-roll, it's not working because you're actually trying to shoehorn something else for a different media into a new media. And you have to have, you know, the, the, the context and the content and they need to be thought of and they need to be worked together to create a great experience. And then you're going to have a, you know, have a, have a great piece of creative that is in the right platform. It's, it's, it's understanding the technology, it's understanding the user experience, where that person is, and it's going to be much, it's going to have a much better performance. I think the creative journey for Outstream is only just starting this year. Um, we've been very lucky to be able to build a business based on the great sort of TV production that's been done in the past. Yeah, and we're now thinking about devices. We're now thinking about you know, location. We're now thinking about how to use those data points. And also our general sort of consumer experience is how we're using sort of the platforms like Twitter, how the platforms like Snapchat, uh, Facebook, the video on there is really shaping the way we want to engage and sort of add to the future. Um, and you know, do it in a, a much more sort of consistent way across all these different um, areas. You're seeing you know, all of the big Media, all the big media agencies are now moving very much into the creative space because they understand the audience, they understand all of the technologies that are delivering the content to that audience, yeah. and they know that they need to make multiple versions of this particular content for the right audience. So you might need to make a hundred different versions of the same piece of communication to reach that audience. And the traditional creative agencies don't do that, so the media agencies are now moving into this space. Yeah. I mean, but the, which kind of begs the question is, you know, is how do we set, how do you set up a world where, you know, where, where you can make that, that quantity of, of, of material? You know, video is, is a real, you know, it's a real challenge. But that's the opportunity, though, rather than a challenge, I think. I think the, um, uh, I think to Justin's point is that we developed the technology, we've had high quality TV production and it's been able to work and, um, and now it's maybe, can we become more creative or mis more bespoke to the actual, because the one thing we haven't touched upon is the devices things that, you know, um, videos watched on. And I think that there's still a place for, so what we see on Twitter is that actually TV advertising, when the TVC goes on um, our platform, it can work very well, you know, with the right context, as you say, the right targeting at the right time. Um, <clears throat> again, we... Uh, another great point that we can't stress enough is that if you have a user first point of view, typically you're more likely to succeed. Like if you have something blaring with the sound on, that really turns people off. Um, if you have a million different ads on one page, that can turn people off. Um, so, and I really like the point about the measurement, instead of not chasing short term revenue, look at potentially making it premium, and they're making it more I'm willing to give up on the data point with sound. I'm willing yeah. to say we, we don't need the science for that. People yeah. don't like sound on. That's yeah, that. and that, that, that's a thing. And I think that's just intuitive, isn't it? And I, for us, is that what we've seen um, is that there's, there's room in the, this world for different <coughs> for th things, whether it's you have a nice, you know, it's not, a, it's not new that when all the big retailers put Christmas ads out, there's a wonderful TV ad, there's a wonderful ad, forget so whatever platform they put it on, it resonates because the creative is wonderful. Um, but it's you know encapsulating the beauty that you have on a mobile device, being accessible all the time, uh, the levels of audience and targeting you can do. So the fact that you don't, you know, demographic targeting, uh, age and gender has been specifically, it's a proxy, isn't it, for interest. So um, you have those things at your fingertips, and it's you know up to us and up to publishers and up to agencies and clients just to really understand that more and more. I want to, I'm conscious of the, the, the length of the session and the amount of material we've got to get through. Um, so I'd like to move on to, chill, to actually, Dara, to, to chat, to start with you with, uh, about, about live and, um, and the kind of the live experience and, and what that looks like. Um, 
Yeah, particularly uh, with reference to the, um, to the sport uh, proposition that you launched recently. Um, how's, that, how's that going and, and you know, what's, the, what's the thinking behind that and how's it going? Bloody brilliantly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I think um, it's really interesting. I think if we go back to the ethos of what I was trying to say in terms of Twitter being a... It was started as a, essentially an SMS messaging uh, notification service um, and then it became more about real-time breaking news um, we know a lot of our users above you know 60% see news break on Twitter and it's the number one news app on iOS etc cetera, etc cetera. now live is as breaking as it gets right it's real is as real-time as it gets and video is the most popular way to consume stuff so it really felt normal or natural um, for us to branch out into this. Now, the difficulty is, obviously, is that it hasn't really been done a lot before. It's been done, but not a load. So we had a pre-existing relationship with the NFL to do other um, bodies whereby we showed stuff, highlights within a minute of a touchdown, for example. They knew it worked. It was very um, it was, you know, good upside for revenue, but the user experience was phenomenal. So we've had this arrangement with them now. Um, I stress that this is simulcast with TV. Um, we say at Twitter, you know, Twitter's a bridge, not an island, so it celebrates other media rather than trying to um, not celebrate it, so to speak. So um, it gives an opportunity for people that are either not watch, able to watch TV to watch it or people that want to watch it alongside TV, so having conversation flowing alongside the game um, or debate as it is. Um, and or just people who prefer watching the experience in a different way. So it's, it's just a, a different choice. And luck, glad to say that it's worked very well. You know, we get um, for the NFL in the high kind of three millions in terms of unique uh, viewing. Um, and that compares to TV, the CBS is, I think, you know, don't quote me, but you can find these numbers about 15 to 20, depending on the game. A lot of it is dependent on the quality of the game. Um, but they, and, and the, the feedback on the tech has been great. And I think what we find, which has been the biggest eye opener, what people like is the social feed into the game, listening to the conversation going on. In the debates is an interesting one because in the debates, you are watching the debate, but you're following that hashtag and you're getting both sides of opinion. You might agree with some, you might not, you might be undecided and it's just a different experience. But uh, what we definitely also know we don't need excess measurement about is that people are using their mobiles more and mobiles are becoming better and the technology is becoming better. So, you know, it's not going to go away. Let's put it that way. I I'd love, sorry, I'd love to follow up on that, but I've just had the nod that you're... I can do another few minutes. Can you? Minutes. Great. Yeah, 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 because, because what I... Um, I know, were you going to interpolate something here, yeah. or can I ask Dara something first? Go ahead. Right, sorry, because I know, I know he's moderate. leaving and, and you're I'm not. I'm so sorry, everyone. Um, so so the, the, the question, is, the question is, is appointment to view. Mm -hmm. you know, we hear that the, live, live is about appointment to view. Everybody knows, has known for ages, sport is the ultimate appointment to view. Mm -hmm. how, how far can you take this into other realms? I mean, the debates, the debates obviously are very competitive, but, but is, you know, we, we have, a, we have it's, it feels to me like there's, you know, there's appointment to view, but there's also a kind of a cultural shift to wanting to be in control, wanting to be in control of the, of the experience to the point where actually I want it watch on my terms. Yeah. How, do, how are those, how, how do you see that balance in, in Twitter? I don't think it's a secret that appointment of view is not as big as it was in years gone by. If you look at iPlayer has more, you know, again, iPlayer usage is going up, ITV, iPlayer is going up, all four going up. Um, Netflix, I mean, the Netflix model is you drop everything on one day. It's not, you know, so Breaking Bad comes out and it's just how desperate you are to watch all of them in, in one go. You know, it's up to you how you schedule it. So the, then that asks questions of what, what is appointment of you about now? So it's typically about either big events or big entertainment shows or... Um, so, for example, Great British Bake Off is not a live programme, but it gets a lot of viewing. You know, it's massive. But, um, but sport is totally appointment of view. It has been um, a live sport, of course. Um, highlights is slightly different. Um, it's appointment of view. And I think that I don't know the answer. Is just a long way of saying that, isn't it? I don't know the answer of how much, you know, the focus on appointment of view. I don't think 
that's really the key focus. I think the control piece, a user control piece, is a very interesting one. I think that's more of a kind of, well, the user wants to decide what device to watch it on, how they're going to watch it. You know, um, I think that is important. But I think it's more determining um, what needs to be live, you know, what's in the public interest to be live. So it's not just, I'll tell you another example is we have a lot of, um, a lot of uh, people love exclusivity. So when you have a, an awards ceremony, when you can see that, what people also like is the behind the scenes stuff. It's quite random actually, because it seems exclusive, it seems scarce. Um, and there's a benefit to those kind of things live. Um, uh, but there's a, a, there'll be hundreds of things that we haven't thought about because they have never existed before. You know, different views in different angles. You know, in the London Olympics, when they had, um, this is before I joined Twitter, but the, the uh, low cog came to us and said, we've got this idea. We're going to put cameras everywhere and you know, tweet out from different cameras. And we're like, that, yeah, good luck, that would be good. It was massively successful because people just wanted, what they were seeing were beautiful shots of people you know, of athletes participating. And I think that we don't know a lot of what we've done, but this goes back to the outstream point. If we just think, the first stuff, I've talked about this before, if you watch, go to YouTube and look for the first ever Pepsi ad. Quick fast fact, James Dean's in it, okay? And this is before he's a famous film actor. And he's dancing around a piano with someone and he has a swig of Pepsi. Now if you turn, if you turn the visuals off, it's a radio ad on TV. It does, it, that's what it is, because they didn't know how to create anything else. They'd only made for radio. And this is the point. The creative TV creator can be phenomenal, but it, that's not limited to that. And that's kind of my point. So in my mind, that actually relates to that. So the world is changing. Think about it from a video perspective. 20 years ago, you would open the TV channel and watch whatever is on. Yeah. Right? Maybe you flip a few channels, but it is what it is. The TV stations would decide what they're showing us. And then the world changed YouTube. I'm going to search. I'm going to decide what I'm, I'm going to look for. And the world is changing to a point of a lot more discovery. Today, and Twitter is a good example for that. And obviously, Facebook is a good example that I'm going there, and I, I'm getting suggestions through there. I'm getting suggestions through my friends of, of what's going on. I'm getting different recommendations. Uh, and a big part of what Taboola has, has done, an amazing job on the sponsored content side you know, before, before we joined, um, is, is around creating that discovery uh, type of feeling. I think with Twitter, with what you're doing on live, we'd love to hear your thoughts on that because there are two modes for that. One is actually the NFL games. The, the, it's, I know I want to watch that. So that's not so much discovery, right? There are very few events in my mind that are justifying maybe like an uh, Apple launch of a product and, and the NFL and the Olympics that, that I know, okay, I'm going to watch or, or the debate from, from last mm -hmm. night. Uh, in, the, in, in the US, so I know I'm going to watch that. Now, do I watch it on Twitter or do I watch it on TV? That's a matter of who's giving me a better experience. But live also provides the ability to actually discover. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what's happening now. I'm sitting on my couch at home. I'm not doing anything special. And live is an opportunity for you to now push, hey, this is happening now. An athlete is preparing or has uh, one stock or an artist is rehearsing. And I think that's a much more interesting implementation of live um, than then okay, let's, let's definitely improve the TV experience with social. Um, and, and I think you, you did not touch on that a lot up until now, the Olympics and that. Yeah, example. so we're doing more, you know, so that is a very interesting thing. One of the things that was prim, uh, the kind of primitive use of that was Q&As. So an artist uh, or a, sorry, you know, an actor would say, join me on Twitter live and you can ask me right. stuff. And that, that's one thing. It's quite raw, but um, yeah, that's definitely an area that we, should be you know exploring um i think for us it's still very very new obviously nfl was the nfl and debates are really that i mean we did conventions and stuff that's kind of linked um it's something new and you know it's i think that's definitely something we should explore and the discoverability is a huge thing um so because you're right people come to twitter and they find stuff out they don't necessarily go to twitter because they know what they're going to find out right. now sometimes they do obviously mm -hmm. you know you sometimes know that there's a debate, so you're going to go there to see what happens, you know. Um, but they also go to find stuff out. So that's the next step, I think, for us. And I think this is big, the big difference for me, if I can build on this, that we're in a world of this sort of non-linear discovery or non-linear usage. If we look at the younger generations, they use video, they use audio, they use text, pretty much in exactly the same way. There's no hierarchy between them. 
Everything that they do has to go to somewhere, though, and that somewhere is usually a publisher or a broadcaster that has good quality content. So finding new ways for these publishers or broadcasters to get that video and get that discoverability is really, really important. Um, and I think that's what we're seeing now. And live is one of those sort of natural mm. things that can add a new dimension. I know for, from our point of view, in the US elections, we've been running sort of live uh, feeds to sort of the Hillary Clinton campaign, for example, as a way for her to get discovered. Um, and yeah, it's fantastic that it's entering sort of new audiences that wouldn't mm. have seen it who are not looking at the TV screen or a, a, a not sort of going to an appointment to view sort of destination on TV. Yeah, finding it from Twitter, finding it from the favourite publisher. That's what we want to really do to get that sort of new discovery out there. And live as sorry, I'm just, just stop, stop, hold that thought. Sorry, guys. Dara, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so um, much. Um, Chris, sorry. I was going to say, and, and live obviously works, you know, incredibly well for brands as well. You know, two big jumps that happened in the last, you know, two years. One was the Red Bull jump. You know, which was a live event, which you know smashed all YouTube's records, and then Mondelez did a uh, a recent jump a couple of months ago for I think Trident, one of their chewing gum brands, which was a guy again jumping out of space, but without a parachute this time, directly into a kind of a, a net. But those two experiences, you know, they managed to gather a huge amount of, uh, of viewers. So yeah, it's uh, it's powerful. There's a really, uh, there's a there's sort of quite an interesting aesthetic question uh, around live at the moment. There's this, there's this notion that live should look different from, from process, from, from you know, traditional video content. Uh, is, that just a, is that just a fashion thing? Is that going to change? Or, or what, 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 are your, what do you think? I think there's, a, there's a, bigger, a bigger debate around raw and polished content and authenticity and transparency. And, you know, there's a, you know, there's a, a big demand and a lot of brands trying to be more human and more real and actually use user-generated content as opposed to such polished kind of high, high, high production values television ads. And they're actually seeing the fact that they're spending less money on the production, but they're getting really great results. And it's actually cutting through. So um, I don't think live necessarily needs to have a, 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 a different sort of creative or production approach. I think it's what's right for that particular event, what's right for that particular audience and you know what's right for that particular medium I, th I think one of the challenges we see quite a lot when we're looking at some of the newer video formats be that live be it something else is that it's going out to market being either or it's TV or outstream it's TV or social video um, versus saying how do we make it complement one another and that's what we need to look at now is because we're in a video ecosystem that has a number of players and um, has a number of use case scenarios. And it's finding the best ways to connect those. Um, and that's what we need to do at the moment because if I'm watching the big screen, I'm generally going to be connected to a smaller screen, be that my mobile, be that my tablet. Um, if I'm on my tablet um, or my mobile, I'm probably out and about uh, as well. So we have to understand the signals, the data that's coming through to really make sure we're either finding ways of connecting uh, the stories together or finding ways to deliver a story that's very relevant to that device. Okay, I want to pick up on, just uh, before we go to questions, I just want to pick up on 360 and get, and get, your, get your views. You know, where, you know, again, where are we? Is it, is it scaling? You know, are, are people engaging with it? Are they getting value out of it? Um, you know, anybody got a particular I think, I think, view? I think that we're, we're at a great point where you know, there's lots of brands looking to kind of trial new innovations and experiences, whether it's interactive, it's 360, it's VR, you know, everybody's looking to try and find something that's going to engage an audience and keep their attention for longer. Um, I think 360 is still very much in its infancy. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, we're in a mobile world, people have attention spans which are less than a goldfish, you know, I think unless this experience is really super amazing, for them to go on a journey is very unlikely. So I still think it's really important to get a great message out as quickly as possible on a mobile device. 360, I think, is super, super exciting. Um, the engagement that we're seeing when it's operated through one of the TEADS formats at the moment has been sort of four, five, six times higher than you get with a standard ad. So it's got that sort of wow factor. Um, there's lots of brands talking about using 360 at the moment. 
but you need to make sure you've got a good bit of creative that's filmed in the right way um, to deliver it. Um, and then what you're finding is you deliver it in the right context, um, you get people really, really engaging with that ad. So I think it's something we're going to see grow a lot more. Um, and as a native experience on a mobile phone, it's just super nice to sort of use when you sort of yeah, interact with it and you can touch and feel it and get a real connection with that uh, brand. I think 360 is, is an experience. It's not a format. I also think live is an experience and not a format. I think that I see there, there are two parts of it. One is make sure we have the reach. Make sure we have the touch points that we're able when, we, when there is an important message for whether it's discovery, whether it's whatever it is, we're able to to some extent broadcast that. Um, and then we have different type of formats and different experiences like we talked about creatives or your fit different type of formats. So what we need to figure out with 360 and Live, do they fit, in what environment do they fit? Um, is it mobile, is it an outstream format, is it data outstream format or another? Uh, so, so that's how I distinguish between the, the two of them. Um, and we'll, we'll see how 360 takes off and probably mo mo more from a creative perspective, but also how does it match specific formats. And, and coming back to one of the points I made, made earlier, as long as these things are user initiated um, and the user is in control, then we're going to see different ways of delivering it. And it might me mean that if I launch with a, a standard push messaging, my second message will be uh, more 360, my third message will be more brand response, my fourth message will be a more direct response. And trying to find the ways to sort of connect them together. Let's make sure we really give the user as much control as they can. Great. At that point, it seems appropriate to hand over to the users and give them some control of the experience. Um, yes. Questions? So I've done this before. Yeah. Um, questions, ladies and gentlemen, does anybody have a question for our panelists? If you could, if you do have a question, um, say who you are, where you're from, that would be great. Yes, gentleman down, about halfway down. Hi, uh, hi, I'm a publisher, uh, Blessed News. So when, when we look for uh, a partner in our stream, uh, we, may, we mainly look at two things. First is uh, uh, the sales team behind and the technology. Sales team because it's the ability to generate demand and technology for latency and all the things that we know. So uh, I got a question for you, Half. Uh, um, we saw that, I mean, well, we, we follow you kind of entering the market. And uh, uh, of course, Tabula has a very strong sales team uh, almost all over the world and for sure here in Europe. And I read that you, you claim that your technology is a superior technology, so it's able to you know, uh, have a better stream, better experience. Can you explain us a bit better why the technology is, uh, uh, is such a better technology? So I think each partner in the space is better in different things. Right? I think what we've done early on is we've focused on the programmatic demand optimization. I think on that side, we've done, we've done well. I think we've built a lot to address some of the inherent challenges of load time of vast VPA tags, um, we've done a lot of, we've built a lot around that side, around mediating uh, different partners through RTB. Um, and video auctioning is, is a mess. Is, like, I'm not happy to get into that later with anyone, but it's basically the first, the highest bidder shouldn't necessarily win the auction. I think we built a lot on that side. So mostly when we're thinking of ourselves, I think there are two things that we're doing well. We're giving publishers control over customizing the experience to how they see uh, uh, that should be the user. They create the rules, and then we try and do personalization by user. If you're a video watcher, we're going to be able to show you a higher impact format. If you're not a video lover, we're going to try and show something that's less impactful or even not show anything, and on the programmatic side. Uh, but but you know, I mean, there are a lot of great companies out there. There are a lot of smart people. That's what we've focused on. I think there are other companies that they were able to build a lot stronger tools uh, to work with agencies and advertisers and be able to bring different kind of demand. For example, we, we have never done 360. We don't have done that. Will we do that in the future? Good chance that we will. Uh, but we have to focus on where we think. So that's where we try to build our, uh, our advantage. I think in some cases we've seen great results with that. But there are a lot of other companies that are they have a lot of things that we don't. So. Um, from a, from a T's point of view, when we're uh, dealing with publishers, I think the first thing we have to look at is what does that publisher need? Everything about Outstream should be about the publisher first. They're the one in the control. They want to make sure they have a technology that works not just on desktop, not just on mobile, but across the new sort of publishing platforms, yeah, such as AMP, for example. Make sure that they have the tools to control um, the revenue generated themselves as well, uh, either from their direct sales teams or from a third party uh, demand source, either a TEED uh, uh, sales team or a programmatic sales team as well. So it's really, again, putting that control in there and having 
having stability of a platform that really works for the publisher, not just for the end user. Great. Any, uh, any further questions? Yes, lady in, in the red top over here. Um, a lot of what's been said on the panel today... Sorry, where, is, where are you oh, from? Oh, sorry, Lauren from Loot Me. Nice red top. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of what's been said today is about having content that works for the platform, so having bespoke content made for mobile, having 360 content, having the audio off so it's not intrusive. How do you think we are going to get brands to the point that they are happy to produce this content? Because I think a lot of pushback at the moment is that brands want the audio, they want their 30 second spot, they don't want to create bespoke content. Okay. Chris, all yours. Um, I think um, <coughs> one, of, one, of the, one of the challenges is that you have um, more traditional agencies in charge of the creative output. So actually the recommendation is being a traditional piece of content but what we're seeing now is a shift where brands are looking to hire and work with the actual makers so either directly with the studio that's making the content or even some brave brands using you know um, clever companies like Blasting News or Vidzi that actually have a um, have a network of makers that actually can make the content and make the volume for them and distribute it so I think that once they see the results of the right content being in the right place, then we'll see more brands who are actually uh, basing the content that they're creating on the results that they're getting from, uh, um, from the audience. So uh, I hope that answers the question. I think my point of view, audio is, is great. True pre-roll, true click-to-play pre-roll, when someone goes to a page that there is a video, they click on it, is a challenging format from a user experience, but, but it, it does user is trapped to watch that, right? So if that's the type of advertising that you're looking at, it, it could be very, very effective. But there's, it's limited. So I think for advertisers, it's not about, you can keep and say, I want to have audio turn on, and then the reality is the true inventory that supports what you want is very limited. If you want to be able to branch out, then we have to, to find a reasonable compromise between the publisher, the advertiser, and the consumer. That is the compromise we have to, to look at. And, I think the viewability piece of it is something that we can control a lot easily, right? We can guarantee viewability, we can uh, provide that, we can have a format that is high impact, that takes a good chunk uh, of visibility. We need to measure engagement, make sure that it performs. But if advertisers want to scale, the reality today in the market that audio is, is not automatically playing. It could be engaged by a mouse movement, but like Facebook uh, is, is, is not doing it. Outstream, which is already a significant part of the market, is, is not doing it. That's your way to scale your campaign and get the reach that you need to. So it's not a, a, a this or that. You should do both, but if you're not going to build creative, if you're going to use the same creative that requires audio on a, on an, on a non-audio environment, it's not going to be as effective. So that's all we've got time for. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen. Justin, you're off. Chris. Thank you.